There is perhaps no area of your life where self-discipline has a greater impact on your future than in your work. Yet, if you're like most people, from the moment you start in the morning and throughout the day, you're surrounded by people and events that draw you away from doing the things that are most important. However, it is through doing your most important tasks that you move onward and upward quickly and dependably in your career. A group of senior executives was asked, what are the most important qualities that a person would need to be promoted in your company? But these executives, 85% agreed that the most important qualities are 1. The ability to set priorities and work on high-value tasks. And 2. The discipline to get the job done quickly and well. It seems that these two qualities are more helpful for career success than anything else a person could do. Diligent, disciplined, focused work will enable you to consistently and predictably get more done, get paid more, and get promoted faster throughout your career than the average person. Separating the relevant from the irrelevant, I mentioned the Pareto Principle, the 80 20 rule, several times in this book, and it applies again here. Fully 80% of the value of what you accomplish will come from 20% of the things you do. Your job then is to identify those top 20% of your tasks and then concentrate single-mindedly on doing them quickly and well. Chapter 13 discusses time management in detail, but for now, let's take a look at the flip side of good time management or time management. According to Robert Half International, the average employee wastes about 50% of his or her time on non-work related activities. 37% of work time is wasted on idle conversations on personal subjects with coworkers, conversations that have nothing we'd ever to do with the job at hand. The other 13% of wasted time is consumed by coming in late or leaving early, long lunches, coffee breaks, surfing the internet reading the newspaper, or conducting personal business during the day. Even worse, when people who waste a lot of time actually settle down and get to work, they spend too much time on low-value tasks and activities. As a result, they get very little done, which then causes them to feel that they are under continual pressure to get caught up. Unfortunately, when you waste time at work, your work does not go away. It continually builds like an avalanche. Deadlines come closer and closer, stress mounts up, until you finally force yourself to do the job, usually at the last minute, and then you often make expensive mistakes. Developing an excellent reputation is crucial. There's nothing that will bring you to the attention of people who can help you faster than for you to develop a reputation for hard, disciplined work every hour of every day. Average employees increase their income at only about 3% per year, which is just about the rate of inflation or cost of living increases. In other words, if you're an average employee, you're not really making any more money from year to year. Rather, you're just keeping up with your expenses. But the top 20% in most fields increase their income anywhere from 10 to 25% per year, which is also compounded year after year. The top 20% of people at work earn 80% of the money. The bottom 80% of employees have no choice but to share the 20% of the money that is left over. They must scramble for the crumbs that fall off the tables of the highly productive people in their fields. You can double your income. When I say to people in my seminars that you should set a goal to double your income in the months and years ahead, people react in different ways. Often at the break, someone will come up to me and say, you don't understand my company. There's no way that I could double my income in my current company. They simply would not pay me that amount of money. Having heard this before, I then ask them the critical question. Is there anyone at your company who earns twice as much as you do? The person that I'm talking to will always agree that yes, there are people in my company who earn two or three times as much as I do. I then make the key point. So, your company is quite willing to pay some people twice as much as they pay you. They're just not willing to pay you twice as much. Why is that? Then suddenly, the light goes on, and the individual realizes that it is not the company that is not willing to pay the money. It is the individual who is not contributing enough to be worth that additional money. The responsibility is on the individual, not the company. The law of three helps you to prioritize. When we coach entrepreneurs, executives, and business owners, we take them through an exercise designed to help them double their productivity, performance, and output within 12 months, sometimes even within 30 days. It's simple. Here's how it works. First, make a list of all the things you do in a week or a month. From the time you start work on Monday morning through to the end of the week. Write down everything, both small and large, including checking your email and returning phone calls. Then review this list and ask this key question. 
If I can only do one thing on this list all day long, which one task or activity contributes the most value to my company? As you go over your list, the correct answer will probably jump out at you. Whatever it is, put a circle around it. Then ask the second question. If I can only do two things on this list all day long, which would be the second task or activity? Review your list again and identify your second most important task in terms of contribution to your company. Finally, ask the question once more. If I could only do three things on this list all day long, what would be the third item? We call this the Law of Three. The Law of Three says that there are three primary things that you do that contribute 90% or more of your value to your company or organization. Your job is to identify those three critical tasks and then discipline yourself to do them all day long. All of your other minor tasks will be support tasks, complementary tasks, enjoyable tasks, or useless tasks. They will be little things that you've gotten into the habit of doing as a way of unconsciously avoiding the big, difficult, important tasks that can make a tremendous difference in your working career. Calculate your hourly rate. Another way for you to double your income is for you to use the hourly rate method of calculating your personal value and your time allocation. First, determine the amount that you earn each hour. You do this by dividing your annual income by the number 2000 which is roughly the number of hours that an entrepreneur or executive works each year in our society, 40 hours a week times 50 weeks a year. For example, if you earn $50,000 a year, divided by 2,000, your hourly rate would be $25. If you earn $100,000 per year, divided by 2,000, your hourly rate would be $50. Whatever it is, from that moment onward, resolve to do only those things that pay your hourly rate or better. Refuse to do those things that someone else can do at a lower hourly rate than you. Do not waste your time doing things of low value or no value while your other important tasks are building up. Get on the same page about what work is most important. Once you have made a list of all the results you feel you have been hired to accomplish and you have determined your three most important things that you do to justify your hourly rate, take your list of key activities to your boss and have your boss organize your job based on his or her priorities. You need to do this because you must be sure. Benjamin Trigo, co-founder of the Kepner Trigo consulting firm and author of The Rational Manager, once said, The very worst use of time is to do very well what need not be done at all. Yet it is amazing how many people are working hard on tasks that are of little or no value to their bosses. No matter how well you do an unimportant task, it doesn't help you. Even worse, working on low-value tasks keeps you from working on the most important things you could be doing. Hard work on the wrong job can actually sabotage your career. The happiest days you will have at work will be when you are working on those tasks that your boss considers to be the most important. The unhappiest days at work will be when you and your boss are at cross purposes and not getting along, primarily because you are not completing the jobs that are most important to him and to his career. Your goal is to be paid more and promoted faster. Your goal is to become one of the most valuable and highest paid people in your field. Your job is first to make yourself valuable and then to make yourself indispensable to your company. This requires, first and foremost, that you are always working on those tasks your boss considers most important. Work all the time you work. The key to doubling your productivity and output, and eventually your income, is to really work all the time you're at work. Simply put, when you work, work. Don't waste time, don't delay, and don't chat with coworkers or sit around drinking coffee. Don't read the newspaper or surf the internet. When you come into work in the morning, put your head down and then work all day long. The biggest time wasters in the world of work are other people who want to talk with you, distract you, delay you, and take up the time that you should be spending on high value tasks. When a time waster approaches you and says, do you have a minute to talk? You reply by saying, yes, but not now. Why don't we talk at lunchtime or after work? In the meantime, I had to get this job finished. I had to get back to work. When you tell people that you're under the gun, that you have to get a task finished for your boss, they will usually leave you alone. If you do this often enough, they will develop the habit of leaving you alone and instead find someone else with whom to waste time. Keep yourself motivated and focused by talking to yourself in a positive way. Your mantra from now on should be, back to work, back to work, back to work. Whenever you find yourself slowing down on a major task, Begin repeating to yourself those magic words, back to work. Who works hardest? The secret survey. Imagine that an outside company is going to do a study of all the people who work in your organization. 
They're going to give each person a list of all the employees and ask them to rate their fellow employees in terms of who works the hardest, the second hardest, and so on. They're then going to give this list of people, organized from the hardest worker down to the laziest, to your superiors. This list is going to be used to determine who gets paid more and promoted faster than others. Now, imagine this survey is already being taken, but in secret. The fact is, in any organization, everyone knows who works harder than anyone else. Everyone knows who works less, who does not pull their weight. Everyone knows. It's not a secret at all. Result today that if a survey like this were to be taken one year from today, you would win the contest. Result today that you are going to develop a reputation for being the hardest working person in your business. This will do more to help you than almost anything else. When you are surrounded by time-wasting people and in situations that waste time, it takes tremendous self-discipline to work all the time you're at work. You must constantly fight against distractions and interruptions so that you can get back to work. Success Formula When I began my career working for a large company, I was the low man on the totem pole. Everyone had been there longer than me and was ahead of me in the company pecking order. Even though I was in my early 30s, I still had no idea how to play the game or what to do to get ahead in the cutthroat corporate competition that existed. Somewhat by accident, I stumbled onto the formula that made me successful. It was very simple. Whenever my boss gave me something to do, I did it immediately. Like a dog chasing after a thrown stick, I would immediately throw myself at the task, complete it, and hurry back to my boss with the finished job. Initially, he would smile and say something like, I didn't really need it done that quickly, but thank you for getting it done. I was caught up with my work. Instead of relaxing, I would go to my boss and say, I'm all caught up. I want more work to do. I want more responsibility. These words became my mantra. I want more responsibility. Again, my boss, who was preoccupied with an enormous number of projects, would say something like, okay, leave it with me, and I'll think about what else I can give you to do. Every day, like a broken record, I would go to my boss at the end of the day and say, I'm all caught up. I would like more responsibility. Bit by bit, he began to toss me tasks. He would give me a little task to do to keep me busy. Whatever it was, I would go out immediately, complete the task, and bring in the results. I would then say, I'm all caught up. I want more responsibility. Within six months, he began to see me as the go-to guy. Whenever he had something he needed done quickly, he passed by everyone else and gave it to me. He knew that whenever he asked what to do, I would do it quickly. Once, my boss asked me to fly to Reno to begin development work on a property that the company was purchasing. He told me I could go sometime in the next couple of weeks. Instead, I left the next morning. I went straight to the lawyer who was handling the transaction and then to the engineer who was in charge of the development work. I immediately sensed that something was seriously wrong with this land purchase. I didn't know what it was, but I went from person to person asking questions and gathering information. By the end of the day, just a few hours before this $2 million transaction was set to close and the money would change hands forever, I found that we were about to be sold a piece of land that had no water and was therefore undevelopable because of complex laws and limited riparian rights. Dot. The property was a worthless piece of ground that could not be developed within the next hundred years. If we had proceeded with the purchase, we would have lost $2 million. I immediately stopped the transaction, demanded that the lawyer cut me a certified check for the $250,000 deposit that was in his trust account, and flew home to my boss to tell him the story. As you can imagine, my boss was very happy with what I had done. From that day forward, I received more and more responsibilities. Within another year, I was running three divisions of the company and had a staff of 42 people in three cities. I later learned that my boss paid me more money than anyone else who ever worked for him, and he did so all on the basis of results and profitability. This is why, whenever people ask me how to succeed in business by really trying, I give them the same advice. Whatever your boss gives you to do, do it quickly and well. Then go and ask for more responsibility, and when you get it, do the job quickly and well until you get a reputation for being the person who does things fast. This will help you advance in your career more than any other reputation. Pay the price. Here is a simple three-part formula for success at work. Come in a little earlier, work a little harder, and stay a little later. This will move you so far ahead of your competitors that they will never catch up. Coming to work one hour earlier, before anyone else arrives.
Use that time to plan and organize your day and get started on your most important tasks. Make sure that whenever your boss comes to work, you are always there working before he arrives. Second, work a little harder. Don't waste time. Don't chat with coworkers. Work through lunchtime so that you can get on top and stay on top of your main tasks and responsibilities. Third, work one hour later than your coworkers. If they leave at five o'clock, you leave at six. Use that extra time to complete your important tasks and get yourself organized for the following day. When you come in one hour earlier, work through lunch, and work one hour later, you add three full productive hours to your day because there are no interruptions when you work during these time periods. You'll actually accomplish two or three times as much as you would during your other work hours when you're constantly interrupted by other people in telephone calls. In fact, you can double or even triple your productivity, performance, and output by simply adding these three hours to your workday. The good news is that by coming in earlier and leaving later, you don't lose anything. You merely avoid the traffic tie-ups and slowdowns that most people suffer through on their ways to and from work. Use the 40 plus formula. This formula says that you can tell where you're going to be five years from now by looking at the number of hours that you put in today in excess of 40 hours per week. If all you do is put in the regular 40 hours that everyone else puts in, all you will do is survive. Your annual increases will be 3 or 4 percent. You will have a job, but your income increases will go up at the same rate as everyone else. It is when you begin to put in more than 40 hours that you give yourself an advantage over most of the other people in your company and your business. Make it a habit to do more than what you are paid for. Discipline yourself to put in more than you take out. Every hour that you work over 40 hours a week is an investment in your future success. The highest paid people in America, in every field, work 50 to 60 hours per week. The average self-made millionaire works 59 hours per week. This is equal to 5 12-hour days or 6 10-hour days. Most successful people, at the beginning of their careers, work 6 days a week, sometimes 7. Moreover, they worked all the time they were at work. They didn't waste time. They realized that in order to reap a great harvest later in their career, they sowed a lot of seeds in the springtime of their career. Finally, to succeed at work, you need to discipline yourself to look the part. Remember, birds of a feather flock together. When it comes to a presentation, this means that people like to promote others who look like them. Your bosses are very sensitive to the appearance of their staff. They like to promote people who they are proud to introduce to their friends and colleagues. Be sure that you dress and groom in such a way that your boss will be proud to take you out for lunch and introduce you to others as a representative of his or her company. Each morning before you go to work, look in the mirror and ask yourself, do I look like one of the top people in my field? If you don't, go back and change, and keep changing until you look like one of the top people in your business. Learn how to dress for success. Read books and articles, or ask others for advice. Look at the most successful people in your business and dress the way they do. Dress for the job two levels above your current job. Remember that fully 95% of the first impression you make on other people will be determined by your dress and grooming. Make sure that the first impression, and then the second and third impressions, are consistent with the message you want to send. Many people work their entire lives without realizing that by putting forward a little extra effort, working a little harder, and focusing on higher value tasks, they can become one of the most valuable people in their organizations. When you discipline yourself to continually increase the value of your contribution to your company, you put your career on the fast track and virtually guarantee yourself a wonderful future. How come there's such a difference between those who can reach incredible heights and those who haven't yet found answers for their life, their health, and their future? We just have to ponder that and let it give us a note of seriousness. It's serious whether you win or lose, whether you succeed or fail, whether you've carved out a good future for yourself or not. Here's how to really capitalize on this year. Number one, life is serious. We call it life or death. Next, make this your best year ever. Have a piece of the 400 million and see what you can do to touch as many people as possible. Number two, get smart. That's what these journals are for. That's what pen and paper are for. That's what taking notes is for. See if you can increase your ability to comprehend ideas, information that can be life transforming. Don't miss the opportunity to learn. Take a good key phrase home and use it in your training. Don't be lazy in learning. Don't be casual in learning. Develop a whole new intensity for the 90s so you're not going to miss the information, the stories, or the details. Here's a couple of parts to it. 
First, your own personal experience. If you've had a bad week, sit down and ponder it for a while. Study it. See if you can pick up some ideas from a poor week and then make a better week. Learn from your own experiences. One way to learn to do it right is to do it wrong. But don't let it take too long. If you've done it wrong for a year, that's long enough. Learn from your own experience. The call didn't go well? Guess what? They made another call. What else can we do to make it better? How can we possibly improve? This is called the possibility for life change, and it starts with education. Don't be lazy in learning. Don't be lazy in picking up ideas. Don't be lazy in learning from your own experience. That's why you've heard from some people who have shared their testimonials here and given you some of their ideas and ways and means of taking this product to the marketplace, making it work for you. We've devoted most of our time to that, and well we should. Learning is the beginning of wealth. Learning is the beginning of change. So, education, get smart. Don't miss the training class. You might say, well, I've already been to one of those classes. I've already heard it. I've got a good phrase for you to take home. That's no sign you've got it. Just because you've listened to those millionaire tapes one time, no sign you've got it. I'm asking you to listen to them over and over and over. I'm asking you to dedicate yourself to a new level of learning in 1992. When I traveled with Mark Hughes in 1992, he had his book open, reading, studying the lives of successful people and lives of despicable people. You know, study, learn, grow, change, develop. Never let it be said you didn't learn, right? If you want to solve your problems, you've got to learn. If you want to take advantage of an opportunity, you've got to learn. We can't come here and just give you the marketing plan, give you the product, send you home. We've got to stay for a while, learn, stay for a while, right? Put on those cassettes and stay for a while. We asked you to come here for a couple of days and stay for a while, do some learning, take it back home. So, number two to have your best year ever. A good piece of that 400 million, make your dreams come true. Number one, get serious. Number two, get smart. Develop your own personal philosophy. Your philosophy majorly determines how your life works out. Each person's philosophy is like the set of the sail. The same wind blows on us all. The difference is where we arrive at the end of the week, at the end of the month, at the end of the year, is not the wind that blows, and the wind is blowing around the world. The world is in solution. Things are changing. The walls have come down. All kinds of things are happening in Russia today. The winds are blowing. But what's going to make the major difference? Each person's personal philosophy. That sets a better sail. So, don't ask for a more favorable wind. That's like wishing for something that's not going to occur. Don't ask for better seed and soil. All you've got is what's available. Don't curse what you've got on this planet. All we've got is the seed that's here, the soil that's here, the miracle of life that's here, the opportunity that's here, the seasons that are here. That's all we've got. Wherever you've come from in your country, the economy you've got, that's all you've got. In America, our economy, that's all we've got. The government, that's all we've got. The marketplace, that's all we've got. Whatever you do, don't criticize. The key is to set a better sale and turn what you've got into the miracle of your future. Don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Don't wish for less problems. Wish for more skills. That's the reason for coming here. Spending a couple of days of intense effort, taking notes, rolling up your sleeves, going to work, committing yourself to learning so that you can get smarter for the days ahead. Develop your philosophy. Herbalife's philosophy has carried it now these 12 years to extraordinary heights. Those who do the work get the pay. A philosophy that commits itself to having the finest, no matter what it costs. That kind of pull up. I'm asking you to develop your own personal philosophy. Get your business philosophy going. Get your financial plan going. Don't violate the conclusion of your own philosophy by not executing and taking action. Get smart. Here's number three. Get going. As smart as you might become after these two days, as many ideas as you take away from here, they're truly like seeds to be planted in the soil. You've got to get going. You've got to take action. The discipline is the miracle process. And here's how to get the miracle of your future going. As far as discipline is concerned, number one, you might go home and set a whole new pace for yourself. We call it cleaning up neglect. Should walk around the block? Could walk around the block for your good health? Don't walk around the block. See, you're on the wrong track. Could read? Could read? Don't read on the wrong track. Should call? Could call? Don't call on the wrong track. Could change? Should change? Don't change. You're on the wrong track. 
Letters you haven't written. Conversations you haven't had with your family. Somebody you should sit down with when you get back home. Get that job done. Don't let neglect destroy your days, destroy your life, and destroy your future. Go back and do what you can. Undoing all that neglect. Second, take immediate action. It is an enemy. Will is a friend. If you start the day with good intentions and you can say, I will, you've got the magic key. You might say, well, I don't think I can do it. Let me share with you about not being able to do it. Let me share with you about the impossible. A lot of things are impossible. But I'm telling you, when you put some energy behind it and some effort behind it, get some help behind it, go to work on it, a lot of things that are impossible just become possible. The magic of those possibilities is available to us all. So, number three, get going. Put yourself into action. Do what you can. Don't let yourself slip. Don't become a victim of neglect. Don't let it destroy the possibilities that are all here for you. Don't let the neglect destroy the progress you could make and the changes you could make in your life, your family, your future. Don't let neglect rob you. Go home and clean up the neglect. Get in action. So, that's what I would like to share with you for these couple of days. It's been a great pleasure for me to be here. You've got to seize it with your own two hands and take advantage. Read the books. Study the tapes. Go back for your notes. Get ready to cash in on the spring. And now, there's a sense of urgency here. Here's why. Spring doesn't last that long. To be able to say, I just got back, doesn't last that long. It's called the springtime of opportunity. Postpone a few things in the springtime. Get the job done. Set aside a few things in the springtime. Get the job done. Report. I was raised in Idaho farm country. What if you asked a farmer to go bowling in the spring? What would he probably say? He would say, you're insane. You can go bowling in the winter when you can't plant the crop. You can't go bowling in the spring. You've only got a certain piece of time, and you've got to get it done in that certain window of opportunity. And that's what we've got here, a window of opportunity. Let's take advantage of it. It's called seizing the spring, and there's also an urgency here. How many springs have you got in a lifetime? Not very many. Life is brief. At the longest, the Beatles wrote, life is very short. And for John Lennon, it was extra short. For Michael Landon, it was extra short. But it is short. There's an urgency here. Don't waste your springs. Don't just let them pass, hoping the time will pass. Take advantage. Last year, it was in, seize the moment. And I'm asking you, this season, to seize the spring opportunity. You've got a new organization going. Seize the spring. You've got a new distributor going. Seize the spring. You've got a new life situation going. Seize the spring. Take advantage of it. Don't let it pass without giving it the best of your two hands and your attention. First, learn how to handle the winter. Second, take advantage of the spring. Number three. In the summer, learn to nourish and protect. We've got some major challenges now come summertime. One is to nourish our values. Take care of them. Feed them. Don't let them go hungry. Then, here's something else. We've got to defend ourselves against the enemies. Summertime is a unique time. It's a time of opportunity. It's also a time of challenge. But what else is new? It's what life has called for the last six and a half thousand years. It reads like this. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. We've got a chance to grow like never before. But I'm telling you, there are going to be many enemies that are going to try to prevent us. As soon as you plant the garden, the busy bugs and the noxious weeds are out to take it. And you've got to learn not only to nourish your values, you've got to learn to do battle with your enemies. Whatever threatens you, I'm asking you to threaten it back. Take care of your responsibility, but don't take anything off anybody. Somebody wants to destroy your chances for a good future by their negative talk, negative thinking, putting it all down, I'm telling you, walk away if you have to walk away. Whatever threatens you, threaten it back. Now, some of our enemies are on the outside. But here's the most important thing to understand. Some of our enemies are on the inside. Let me give you a quick list. Indifference. You've got to do battle with your own indifference. Boy, it's easy to coast, especially if you've accomplished something extraordinary. Now, if somebody says, I've got to relax, here's the key, not too long. The weeds will take over your plan if you rest too long. Don't rest too long. Don't rest too long. Indecision. You've got to make those decisions. The ones that don't turn out to be good give you experience to make better decisions. Don't let much time go by without making some decisions. The ones that you can make quickly, make them quickly. The ones that take time, take your time. But get those decisions made. 
Don't let indecision be an enemy. Doubt. Sure, there's doubts on the outside. People doubt that America is going to make it. People doubt that Europe's going to make it. People doubt that Russia is going to make it. Poland, Czechoslovakia. They doubt the whole world is going to make it. But I'm asking you not to pick up all those doubts. I'm asking you to have some faith, have some courage, and believe. Drive your doubts into a small corner. Don't let them loose like a mad dog. Drive them into a small corner. Don't doubt the future. Don't doubt the possibilities. Don't doubt the extraordinary gifts that your distributors bring to your organization. Don't doubt that. Here's the most important one of all. Don't doubt yourself. If I've got miracle working power to change my life, so do you. If I've got the ability to change, so do you. If I've got the ability to read, so do you. If I can discover, so can you. If I can grow, you can grow. If I can develop, you can develop. If I can get an invitation like I got six years ago to help take something around the world, so can you. I can stand on this platform, Idaho farm boy, raised in obscurity. So can you. If the millionaire team can do it, president's team can do it. Walk off with the diamonds, the trophies, so can you. I'm asking you, don't sell yourself short. We haven't sold you short. That's why Mark, Larry, Dr. Katzen, and I have decided to invest a big share of our lives in these four days being with all of you. If we didn't think you were worth it, we wouldn't have shown up. We don't need to collect another meeting. We don't need to walk on another stage. We don't need to get up early like we do. We don't need it, except for the challenge and the opportunity to invest in this many people's lives. Who wouldn't get up early to have a chance to work miracles and invest in this many people's lives and help turn the world upside down for better nutrition? Call Herbalife. Here's the next one, worry. I'm asking you to drive worry into a small corner. You've got to worry about something. All this negative stuff certainly serves some purpose. But the key is for you to be the master, not the servant. If it's two o'clock in the morning and your daughter's not home yet, best you worry. In New York City, if you step off the curb and one of those yellow taxis is coming, best you worry. But here's what I'm asking you to do. You be the master of worry. Drive it into a small corner. Don't let it loose. And I'm asking you to go home with some new faith and some new courage. Don't worry, drive it into a small corner. We've all got concerns, and sometimes we all wonder, and sometimes there's a little crack of doubt. But here's the key, keep it small. Don't let it loose. Don't let it destroy your dreams. Don't let it kill your faith. Don't let it ruin your life. Here's the next one, over caution. Some people never start anything. They wait. They've got to make sure there are no mistakes. No, don't make a mistake. Don't start a business that you know has got to be closed in six months. But here's what else is important. Don't wait until you can make no mistakes. Don't wait until you're sure that you'll succeed. Don't wait until all the lights are green before you leave home. If you wait for that, you'll never leave home. The lights are never all green. Someone once said, you can't build a reputation on what you're going to do. That's over caution. You've got to be willing to take a chance. You've got to be willing to put your guts on the line. You've got to be willing to take a risk. Drive caution into a small corner. Don't let it loose. It can be beneficial, but it can also be destructive. And I'm asking you, don't let it destroy your chances for greatness. Don't let it destroy your chances for success. And some people just don't have any appetite for risk. Don't get to be 80 years old and find out you could have been a risk taker. You could have had your own business. You could have been independent. You could have been free. You could have been wealthy. You could have had influence and power. Don't sell yourself short. Don't cheat yourself out of the blessings and the miracles of life that you deserve. That's over caution. Here's the last one, pessimism. It's a real challenge, and sometimes it sounds like wisdom. Someone says, well, you've got to be careful, you've got to be wise, you've got to be cautious, you've got to look for the downside. All that's good advice, but here's what else is good advice. You've got to believe in tomorrow. You've got to believe in the possibilities. You've got to believe that every life is precious. You've got to believe that every life is worth saving. You've got to believe that every life is worth serving. You've got to believe that every life is worth helping. Don't be pessimistic about the future. We can change the future. We can alter the course of history. And I'm asking you to be a part of it. Here's what else is important. Drive your philosophy into a small corner. Be the master, not the servant. Use it as a tool, not as a crutch. That's a major challenge. Learning how to handle the winters, take advantage of the springs, nourish and protect in the summers, and prepare for the harvest. 
If you'll start working on your philosophy, getting that in good order, then it'll start to order your days. It'll start to order your values. It'll start to order your life. And your life will really start to take a major change. We call that progress. And progress is not only possible, progress is essential. You see, here's what we teach the kids. Take advantage of the spring. Get ready for the summer. Plant in the spring, and you'll have in the fall. If you plant in the spring, you'll have in the fall. If you wait until the fall, forget it. It's too late. It's too late to plant in the fall. It's too late to speculate in the fall. Now, you can speculate any old way you want to, but that's not going to alter the fall. The only thing that's going to alter the fall are the risks you take in the spring. If you plant in the spring, you'll have in the fall. If you plant your values in the spring, you'll have the fall. If you make a few investments in the spring, you'll have in the fall. If you give some extra time in the spring, you'll have in the fall. And if you'll do it now, if you'll get excited now, if you'll change your philosophy now, if you'll go to work on yourself and develop the skills now, then you'll have in the fall. And I'm telling you, the fall will be yours. The spring and the fall will be yours. You can have a brand new life. You can have a new beginning. You can have a new life story. You can have a whole new deal, your own miracle. That's what we've got available. And all you've got to do is take advantage of the spring. If you're in sales, it's crucial to evaluate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being the lowest and 10 being the highest, in several key areas. To be in the top 20% of your field, you need to score a minimum of 7 across the board. Your weakest skill sets determine the height of your income and how fast and far you progress in your career. Identifying one skill to develop excellently can have the greatest positive impact on your career trajectory. This becomes your major definite purpose for personal and professional development. For those in management, success or failure often hinges on seven key result areas. Planning, organizing, staffing, delegating, supervising, measuring, and reporting. Excellent managers excel in each of these areas, while poor managers struggle in one or more. Identifying the key area for improvement and setting it as a goal is essential for professional growth. From an early age, individuals exhibit certain natural talents and abilities, which often remain consistent throughout their lives. Discovering and developing these talents is key to personal and professional fulfillment. Recognizing what you love to do, what you do well, and what brings you success and happiness can guide you toward your area of special talent. You may need to invest time and effort in developing skills that are not your natural strengths but are essential for excellence in your chosen field. The rule of thumb is that you could be only one skill away from doubling your productivity, performance, and income. Dedication and determination are required to master critical skills and rise to the top of your field. A 3 plus 1 formula for mastering any skill involves reading daily in the skill area, listening to educational audio programs, attending seminars and workshops, and practicing what you learn. Making a lifelong commitment to excellence. Identifying key result areas, and focusing on improving your weakest key area are immediate steps you can take to advance in your field. Remember, no one is better or smarter than you, and with dedication, you can join the top 10% in your industry. IIFU will an acorn planted in fertile soil over time with the right amount of sunlight, rain, and care. It grows into a magnificent oak tree towering over the landscape, its branches reaching for the heavens. This seemingly insignificant acorn, at first glance, holds within it the potential to become something grand, something majestic. Like that acorn, each of us holds within its untapped potential, a promise of greatness waiting for the right conditions to emerge, to grow, to soar. Now, think about this for a moment. How often do we limit ourselves, not by our abilities, but by our beliefs about what we can achieve? How often do we let the fear of failure, the shadow of doubt, or the comfort of the familiar hold us back from reaching for the skies? It's a question worth pondering, isn't it? You see, my friends, we're all born to fly high, not in the literal sense, of course, but in the realm of what's possible, in the vast expanse of our potential. The only limits that truly exist are the ones we place upon ourselves, and yet, the sky is the limit for those who dare to dream, for those who dare to believe in the possibility of what could be. Now, let me ask you another question. What would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? Imagine the possibilities, the opportunities that would unfold before you. It's a powerful thought, isn't it? The truth is, failure is not the opposite of success. It's a part of it, a stepping stone, if you will, on the path to achieving greatness. 
Every setback, every obstacle is an opportunity to learn, to grow, and to come back stronger. This is the essence of embracing your potential. It's about recognizing that within you lies the ability to achieve remarkable things, to overcome challenges, to reach new heights. It's about understanding that you are the architect of your destiny, the master of your fate. And it's about taking that first step, however small, towards realizing your dreams. I invite you to open your mind, to embrace the possibilities that lie ahead. Remember, you were born to fly high, to reach for the stars, to achieve what may seem impossible to others. The question is, are you ready to unfold your wings and soar? The ways in which we can unlock our potential, set our sights higher, and overcome the fears that hold us back, dive into the strategies and principles that can guide us on this path to greatness. Together, we will discover how to harness the power within us to become the best version of ourselves, to live a life of purpose, passion, and unparalleled achievement. Are you ready? Let's begin this journey together, and let's fly high. Recognizing and understanding our unique talents and abilities is akin to discovering our own set of wings. Each one of us, without exception, is gifted with a unique set of talents and abilities, as distinct and individual as fingerprints. The magic, however, lies not just in possessing these talents, but in recognizing and utilizing them to their fullest potential. Consider for a moment the myriad of individuals who have achieved greatness in their lives. What sets them apart? Is it merely hard work, or is it something more? It's their profound understanding and application of their unique talents and abilities. They've identified their strengths and built their lives around them, allowing them to not just succeed, but to soar. So, how does one go about identifying these unique talents? It begins with introspection. Ask yourself, what activities give you the most satisfaction? What tasks do you find effortless that others may struggle with? This introspection is not a one-time activity, but a continual process of self-discovery. Your talents may evolve and change as you grow, and it's crucial to stay attuned to these changes. Another practical step is to seek feedback. Often, those around us can see the talents in us that we might overlook. Ask trusted friends, family members, or colleagues about what they think you excel at. You might be surprised by what they see in you that you've never noticed yourself. Once you've identified your talents, the next step is to hone them. This is where commitment and dedication come into play. Talent alone, without skill, can only take you so far. Skill is talent refined, talent honed to perfection through practice and perseverance. Invest time in mastering your craft, be it through formal education, mentorship, or self-study. Remember, the goal is not just to be good but to be exceptional. Now, you may wonder, why is this so important? Why go through the effort of identifying and honing your talents? The answer is simple yet profound. Your talents are your ticket to flying high. They are the foundation upon which you can build a life of fulfillment and success. When you align your career and life choices with your talents, you unlock a level of energy and enthusiasm that can propel you to heights you've never imagined. You move from merely existing to truly living. But let's not forget, identifying and developing your talents is not just about personal success, it's about contribution. It's about making a difference in the world in the way that only you can. When you operate from a place of strength, you're in a better position to help others, to contribute positively to your community, and to make the world a better place. I encourage you to take the time to understand your unique talents and abilities, embrace them, develop them, and use them as the foundation for your journey to greatness. Remember, you were born to fly high, and your talents are the wings that will get you there. Let's not just dream of flying, let's spread our wings and soar. Together, we can reach unimaginable heights, fueled by the unique talents that reside within each of us. Let this be our mission, our commitment, and our joy. Understanding our unique talents is akin to finding our wings. Yet, knowing how to fly is not enough if we don't have a destination in sight. This is where the power of setting ambitious goals comes into play. It's about charting a course to our dreams, about defining the heights we aim to reach. Imagine standing at the foot of a mountain, gazing up at its peak veiled by clouds. The peak represents your highest aspirations, the dreams that stir your soul in the quiet of the night. Setting ambitious goals is like mapping out the path to that peak. It's a declaration of your intent to not just gaze at the summit, but to reach it, to plant your flag at the top and say, I made it. But how do you set goals that truly stretch your capabilities and lead to substantial growth? It begins with allowing yourself to dream big. 
Often, we limit ourselves with practicalities and probabilities, cutting our dreams down to size before they've had a chance to breathe. I invite you to dream without limits, to set goals so ambitious they scare you a little because in that stretch, in that reach, lies your growth. The next step is to break down your lofty goal into achievable steps. Think of it as creating a staircase to your summit. Each step is a smaller, specific, and measurable goal leading you inevitably to the top. This process demystifies the journey, making even the most ambitious goals seem attainable through consistent effort. But setting the goal is only half the battle. Achieving it requires a plan of action. This is where the principle of reverse engineering comes into play. Start with your end goal in mind and work backward, identifying each step you need to take, each milestone you need to achieve to make your goal a reality. This method not only clarifies the path ahead, but also highlights the skills, knowledge, and resources you'll need to gather along the way. Accountability plays a crucial role in the pursuit of ambitious goals. Share your goals with someone you trust, someone who believes in you and your vision. This could be a mentor, a friend, or a coach. Having someone to share your progress with, to cheer you on when the going gets tough, and to remind you of your why when you falter can make all the difference. Remember, the pursuit of ambitious goals is not a sprint but a marathon. There will be setbacks and detours, times when the peak seems obscured by clouds of doubt. In those moments, resilience becomes your greatest ally. Remind yourself why you set out on this journey, reflect on the progress you've made, and know that each step forward, no matter how small, is a victory in itself. As we set our sights higher, embracing the power of goals, let us do so with courage and conviction. Let us commit to the journey, not just the destination, for it is in the pursuit of our dreams that we truly find ourselves. Let us not be daunted by the distance between where we are and where we aspire to be. Instead, let's take that first step and then another, fueled by the knowledge that with each step, we grow stronger, more capable, and closer to the life we dream of. Setting ambitious goals and embracing our unique talents, there stands a formidable gatekeeper. This gatekeeper, known by many names, often goes by the simplest and most universal one, fear. In its many forms, fear has the power to stop us in our tracks, to cloud our vision, and to keep us from taking that crucial first step towards our dreams. But what if I told you that overcoming fear is not just possible but essential for your flight towards success? What if I said that on the other side of fear lies freedom, growth, and the realization of your full potential? Let's consider for a moment the nature of fear. Fear, at its core, is a protective mechanism. It's designed to keep us safe from harm. However, in our modern world, the fears we face are often not life-threatening. Instead, they are the fears of failure, of rejection, of stepping out of our comfort zones. While these fears may seem daunting, they are not insurmountable. One of the first steps in overcoming fear is to recognize it, acknowledge the fear, give it a name, and understand its source. Ask yourself, what am I really afraid of? Often, just putting a name to the fear can diminish its power over you. Next, challenge your fear, question the validity of the fear. How likely is the scenario you're afraid of to happen? And even if it is, what's the worst that can happen? More importantly, what's the best that can happen if you move forward despite the fear? By challenging your fear, you begin to see it not as a barrier but as a hurdle to overcome. History and literature are replete with examples of individuals who faced their fears and achieved remarkable success. Consider the story of a young girl who, despite being born into a world where women were expected to remain in the background, dared to dream of becoming a pilot. This girl, Amelia Earhart, not only learned to fly but also became the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Her courage to pursue her dream despite the fears and societal expectations of her time remains a powerful testament to the human spirit's ability to overcome fear. Or think about the countless entrepreneurs who faced the fear of failure but chose to press on. Their stories, marked by setbacks and rejections, yet unwavering in their pursuit of success, inspire us to confront our own fears and strive for greatness. Each of these stories begins with a choice. The choice to face fear head on and to move forward despite it. Another powerful strategy for overcoming fear is visualization. Imagine yourself achieving your goal, soaring high, and experiencing the success you dream of. Visualization not only helps to build confidence but also prepares your mind for the journey ahead. Moreover, take action. Action is the antidote to fear. Each step you take, no matter 
How small builds your confidence and diminishes your fear. Remember, you don't have to leap. You can take small, measured steps. The key is to keep moving forward. In overcoming fear, it's also crucial to surround yourself with a support system. People who believe in you, encourage you, and lift you up. Their faith in you can be a powerful motivator when your own faith falters. As we stand at the threshold of our dreams, looking into the vast sky of possibilities, let us remember that fear is but a shadow that diminishes in the light of our courage. Choose to be brave, to take that first step, and to keep moving forward. For on the other side of fear lies our greatest potential, our highest achievements, and the realization of our dreams. Let us not allow fear to be the reason we don't try. Instead, let it be the reason we soar even higher. We've navigated through recognizing our unique talents and the significance of setting ambitious goals. We've also looked fear in the eye, understanding its nature and learning strategies to overcome it. Now, let's turn our attention to another crucial element in our journey, perseverance. Perseverance is the steady persistence in a course of action or purpose, especially in spite of difficulties, obstacles, or discouragement. It's the relentless refusal to give up, driven by a deep-seated belief in one's goals and abilities. But what truly is the role of perseverance in achieving success? Consider for a moment the story of an inventor who faced failure 1,000 times before finally achieving the breakthrough he sought. This inventor, Thomas Edison, when asked about his failures, famously said, I have not failed. I just found 1,000 ways that won't work. Edison's invention of the light bulb was not just a testament to human ingenuity but a powerful illustration of perseverance. His unwavering commitment to his vision despite numerous setbacks changed the world forever. Or think about the tale of a young girl with a dream of becoming a published author. She wrote her first novel in a cafe, scribbling on napkins while her baby daughter slept beside her. Her manuscript was rejected by 12 publishers before finally being accepted. That author, J.K. Rowling, went on to create one of the most beloved book series in history, inspiring millions of readers worldwide. Her journey from a struggling single mother to a best-selling author is a vivid reminder that perseverance, coupled with a belief in one story, can lead to extraordinary success. These stories and countless others share a common thread. The unyielding perseverance of individuals who refuse to let setbacks define their journeys. They remind us that success is not the absence of failure but the ability to keep going despite it. The role of perseverance in achieving success cannot be overstated. It is, without a doubt, the wind beneath the wings of every great achievement. So, how can we cultivate this invaluable trait? Firstly, by setting clear, meaningful goals that ignite our passion. It's easier to persevere when we are deeply committed to our objectives. Secondly, by embracing failure as a part of the learning process, understanding that each setback brings us closer to our goals. And thirdly, by maintaining a positive outlook, viewing challenges as opportunities to grow and strengthen our resolve. Let's also draw inspiration from the people around us from those who have faced their own battles and emerged victorious. Their stories are not just tales of triumph but beacons of hope, reminding us that with perseverance, anything is possible. Your path to success is rarely a straight line. It's fraught with challenges, detours, and sometimes dead ends. But with perseverance, we can navigate through the storms, reach new heights, and achieve our dreams. The wind beneath our wings is not just the talent we possess or the goals we set but the perseverance that propels us forward day after day toward our destiny. So let us hold fast to our dreams, persist through the challenges, and emerge stronger, wiser, and closer to our goals. With perseverance as our compass, the sky is the limit, and there is truly no height we cannot reach. With its myriad challenges and opportunities, one principle stands as a beacon guiding us towards our fullest potential, the principle of continuous learning and growth. This principle is not merely an academic idea. It is the very essence of a fulfilling and successful life. Just as a ship must adjust its sails to navigate the currents and winds of the ocean, so too must we adjust our minds and skills to navigate the ever-changing currents of our lives. Lifelong learning and personal development are the keys to unlocking doors we didn't even know exist. The world around us is evolving at an unprecedented pace, with new knowledge, technologies, and ways of thinking emerging every day. To stand still, to believe that we have learned all there is to learn, is to be left behind by the tide of progress. But how do we foster a mindset of continuous learning, 
How do we keep the flame of curiosity alive in our hearts and minds? Firstly, we must cultivate a sense of wonder and curiosity about the world around us. Approach each day with the question, what can I learn today? It could be something as simple as a new word, a fact about the universe, or a deeper understanding of a friend or colleague. The goal is not the accumulation of facts, but the development of a mind that seeks to understand, question, and explore. Secondly, set personal development goals, just as you would career or financial goals. These could range from learning a new skill, such as a language or instrument, to improving soft skills like public speaking or leadership. The act of setting these goals creates a roadmap for your growth, making the abstract idea of personal development concrete and actionable. Moreover, learning is not a solitary journey. Engage with communities of like-minded individuals. This could be a book club, a class at a local community college, or an online forum dedicated to your area of interest. These communities provide not just knowledge but support, motivation, and the invaluable perspective of others. To stay motivated in your journey of continuous improvement, remember the wipe behind your efforts. Remind yourself of the doors that personal growth can open, from career advancement to enriched personal relationships, and the deeper understanding of the world and your place within it. Another vital tip is to integrate learning into your daily routine. Make it as habitual as brushing your teeth or checking your email. It doesn't have to be a monumental task each day. Even dedicating 15 to 30 minutes to reading, practicing a skill, or listening to a podcast can have a profound cumulative effect over time. Remember, the pursuit of knowledge is a pursuit of joy, the joy of discovery, of pushing the boundaries of your capabilities, and of seeing the world and yourself in new and exciting ways. Let the principle of continuous learning and growth be the wind beneath our wings, propelling us to new heights, uncharted territories, and the realization of our wildest dreams. With curiosity as our compass and determination as our sails, there is no limit to how far we can go, how much we can grow, and what we can achieve. In our expedition to reach the zenith of our potential, we've explored the essence of recognizing our talents, setting lofty goals, overcoming fears, and embracing continuous learning. Now, let's delve into another vital element. The influence of the company we keep on our ability to soar to greater heights. It's often said, show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. This statement holds profound truth, as the people we surround ourselves with have a significant impact on our thoughts, actions, and ultimately, our success. Just as a single bird struggles to fly against a strong wind but soars effortlessly within a flock, so too do we rise higher and faster when we align ourselves with skyward thinkers. Skyward thinkers are those individuals who not only dream of achieving great things, but are also actively working towards these goals. They are the mentors who guide us, the peers who challenge us, and the friends who encourage us. Their belief in the possibility of reaching new heights fuels our own aspirations and propels us forward. So, how does one find and cultivate relationships with these remarkable individuals? It starts with a conscious decision to seek them out, attend seminars, join clubs, or participate in online forums related to your interests and goals. These venues are often frequented by people who share your aspirations and possess the positive, forward-thinking mindset you seek. Once you've identified potential mentors and peers, the next step is to reach out. Remember, the foundation of any strong relationship is mutual respect and value. Be genuinely interested in learning from them and be open to sharing your own experiences and insights. A mentor-mentee relationship, for instance, is not a one-way street. It's a partnership where both parties grow and learn. Be proactive in cultivating these relationships. This means not only seeking advice when you face challenges but also celebrating successes together. Show appreciation for their guidance and support. Remember, a simple thank you can go a long way. But perhaps most importantly, strive to be a skyward thinker yourself. Be the mentor, peer, and friend who uplifts others by embodying the qualities you seek in others. You attract like-minded individuals into your life. It's a virtuous cycle. As you help others rise, you too will ascend. Reflect on the essence of our exploration, from the acorn of potential within each of us through the cultivation of our unique talents, the setting of ambitious goals, the overcoming of fears, the unwavering perseverance, the commitment to continuous learning, and the importance of surrounding ourselves with skyward thinkers. We've charted a course for flying high. Now, it's time for action. 
It's time to spread your wings and take flight, embracing the vast, limitless possibilities. Remember, the journey to greatness is not traversed by the faint-hearted but by those who dared to dream, to believe, and to act. Your potential is infinite, your dreams valid, and your aspirations achievable. As we part ways, carry with you this mantra, a beacon to light your path. Believe in yourself, in the power of your dreams, and in the beauty of your journey. The sky is not the limit, it's your beginning. Let this not be a farewell, but a commencement of your ascent to heights yet unimagined, to dreams yet realized. Take flight, my friends, with courage, passion, and determination. The world awaits the magic only you can.